All right, good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study. I praise God. We've been waiting on you. We're ready to get into our Father's Word. I want to spend the next two days kind of visiting at the same time, touching on Job a little bit, and then, if God wills, we'll, we'll start uh, the book of St. John in two lectures. I would like for you to know the real true story of Christ's life, as it is from God's Word. That's the only place you can get it and have it accurate. Due to these troubled times, we need to know how to live in the flesh. Therefore, it behooves one to look at the book of Job, to understand it, as well as Ecclesiastes. So I thought we'd go into it a little bit. We ask our Father's uh, wisdom. We ask his blessings in Yeshua's name. Amen. I can never illustrate how that some people think that God is some awesome force out here uh, that's really invisible to the eye, and as long as you're in the flesh, uh, basically that, in part, that's true. But just a huge mass with lightning bolts striking from it, killing people, striking them down, it being more of the destroyer than the God of love, that's just not true. As a matter of fact, our Father looks exactly as we and the angels do because we were made in their image. He looked like we do. I'm not saying the physical makeup is the same, but the uh, image, which in the Hebrew can... Even I could go to the extreme and say we were a phantom in a sense of them. In other words, but exact, exact. Of course the texture of the mass being clay, or that that is growing from the clay that we consume, but through metabolism that gives us this flesh body that we have. But still, the same soul, the same soul, the same spirit, that even was in the world that was, that our Father brought here and placed in that embryo when you were born into the flesh. Same soul, a different body. But yet a body that looked the same. What do we know truly about heaven? What do we know about our Father? I'm going to give you a scholar's thoughts on it. Where is he? And the reason I'm bringing this up, that in Job, Satan and the other angels went before him, before the throne. I would like to remind you from the book of Ecclesiastes, there is nothing new under the sun. Which means what? God has a set pattern. What goes around comes around. The water rains, goes down the river, into the sea, through the cloud, one circle, continuous, nothing new under the sun. Always the same. So we can, we can know somewhat about heaven. I feel even its present location. With that thought in mind, with that logic, we know that heaven, the throne, will be de facto upon the earth. However, the geographical expanse, no, I did not say terra firma, expanse, is on this earth, headquartered here, but it is a 1,500 mile cube meaning that 1,500 miles into space, so to speak, the sky, and back around Jerusalem, you have the earth age and the heaven age. I have no reason to doubt, in as much as there's nothing new under the sun, that that's where the Father is today in a dimension that we in the flesh cannot see. I think the fellow servant that came to earth that Daniel could very clearly see fell down to worship him. He said, get up. I'm just like you are. I'm a fellow servant. However, he was in the incorruptible body. In other words, he had more than likely passed on and was simply a messenger. After all, is that not what the word angel means? So what I'm telling you is, is your father is not far from you. Now, let's not get real spiritual and say, well, you don't understand he is in me. No, his spirit is. 
he's not all that far from us. He's totally and completely in control. And that's why when you are aware of that nearness, less than 1,500 miles, the entire uh, dimension, I might just say a word on that, at the risk of adding confusion, when Christ was on earth, he could walk through a wall because he was in a different dimension. Matter and mass in different dimensions does not necessarily interfere with the presence of the other. And that's said on that. <clears throat> but your father loves you very much. And as we see this time of the year when we have pressure and tension, it's easy for arguments to get started in the family. I had a report of a woman stomping a man's foot till he had to take off work even. I mean, tempers fly. That wasn't the case. He was, he was injured. He, I think he's just saying that, okay? But we do have quarrels during these dog days, may we call it. Hey, don't pick on each other. God is love. Tell each other that you love each other. And don't let Satan with his negative thoughts work his way into your family. You order him out. Oh, there's nothing he would like better than to allow you to just turn your family over to him and begin to argue about little old pity and things that don't amount to a hill of beans. Almost, and then comes the word divorce. Over what? Over immaturity in Christ. It is for this reason that we're going to look at Job. What, what does the word Job mean? Persecuted. Job means persecuted because, in fact, he is a type of God's election. A people that God chose before the foundations of the earth, as it is written in Ephesians 1, chapter 4, Romans chapter 8, as well as many other places. Because he knows what kind of stuff their soul is made out of. Can-do type people. Mature people. So, that's why Job was named persecuted, because Christians, I'm talking about true Christians, you're going to have persecution. If... You, that, that if is certainly a magnificent word. Do you know why? If means a condition has been added to something, and if means there is a possibility, more than likely, that you can overcome it. If means you have an alternate course whereby you can sidestep the persecution. If means that you are persecuted only if you allow it. Only if you allow it to bother you. It is unpleasant oft times to have to speak out so boldly as we did in the last lecture concerning this stupid movie that's being released at this time. Not that it's going to destroy Christianity, but the fact that it lies about our Lord and Savior. Because, you see, to a scholar, even as much as he was quoting while on the cross, Psalms 22, and as much as he had to be spotless, our Christianity is a lie. And the in-depth truth is, when they show him having thoughts that pertain to flesh, which the Kenite has always wanted to imply in the ignorant's mind that Jesus was nothing but flesh, though he was flesh. He was a great deal more. But they like to get in their little licks. But don't, you don't even have to worry about it. God, through Christianity, will destroy. He will draw Christians close together. And it will, it will do harm to Satan and his people. It will backfire. They have a tiger by the tail, in other words. Even that persecution... Even when you speak boldly out against something, it doesn't bother you because you know and truly understand that you're in the service of the king 
and we will accomplish his work, and we shall have the victory. Having a purpose and a destiny gives you purpose in life, gives you purpose in the flesh. And when you realize your destiny, and when you realize your purpose, you don't really have all that much time to end up in spots over unimportant events or things. But to put your mind in motion, understanding your Father's Word. Again, He's not that far from us. For if heaven and earth, that is to say the earthly kingdom and the heavenly space put in a 1,500 mile cube, if it would be that way in the Trinity, so it is today. So it is today. He's not that far away from us. Even the very throne itself that has even visited, <coughs> excuse me, this earth age. So you see, Satan is there as the adversary, and he taunts God because of those God has chosen, those that proved they could conquer Satan even in the world that was. For as it is written in this book of Job, chapter 1, verse 7, Satan and the angels, at a time when they appear, appeared before God, God asked, Yahweh asked Satan, what you going to do? He said, oh, I've been walking to and fro on the earth. And God said, hey, Abel, what do you think about my servant Job? Isn't he something? In other words, God was taunting Satan. He said, he's mine. I even named him persecuted. Oh, that's what they call him. A very rich man from God's blessings <laughs> has everything he wants. And even Job's sons and daughters, the numerical value of them adds up to spiritual completeness, meaning God was really proud of this one. But the teaching within Job is to show you that when you are God's elect, if you allow it, and if you allow the world to twist your thinking, the persecution then will become quite painful. As a matter of that in fact, as we would continue on in Job, in chapter 2, we would see another time when the sons of God, that's to say the angels and Satan, would appear before the throne of God, about 1,500 miles out here. And he would say to Satan again, what do you think about my servant Job? And of course, by this time, Satan said, oh, he doesn't amount to anything. You've got that wall around him. You pull that down and take your blessings away from him. I can have him just like that. Tom said, all right. I'll pull the wall down. I'll let you try, but I will not allow you to, to destroy his life. Well... You might as well, uh, you know, in, in Satan's attack then through his family, uh, we have within the very first few days his life when the sores and the boils and the death of the children and the loss of flocks and go from, rich, from riches to poverty and almost overnight his wife said, why don't you just curse God and die? Satan said, I haven't sinned. I haven't done anything. And I will not denounce my father. I know I'm innocent. Then about this time on the scene, as you have in daily life, when you feel a little persecution, we got three good old boys show up on the scene. And then we've got 37 chapters of yakety, yakety, yakety. Yakety, yakety, yakety. Yakety, yakety, yakety. And that's why I'm not going to teach you Job on television. I have the, the entire book taught on audio, and it, you're free to, and welcome to it. It's not free, but you're welcome to order the tapes. If you want to know what, if, if, if your life is persecuted and you want to know how Job handled it, it's well worth going through. It ends up, um, if you would, that one of these so-called good friends ends up even being a false prophet. 
And yes, I've even heard ministers quote what this idiot says God said. <laughs> it's written in the good old King James. It's written in the manuscripts. God said, etc., etc. You know something? It was the man that was stating it, not God. So you see, God allows even men today to deceive themselves if they so choose. And after 37 chapters of yakety, 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 finally God shows up on the scene. And showing up on the scene, I would like to think it would be as it is today when people, if they're not real careful, find themselves confused, frustrated, and wondering, do we really have the truth, etc.? Or, on the other hand, you have a certain element that grows so wise. They feel they know everything and they're ready to give advice to everyone. Yakety, yakety, yak. And the entire plan of God is right here. It's written. If you have a problem, if you have a need, all you have to do is go to your Father's Word. But I will say this for Job. He never, never gave in to Satan. He said, I'm innocent. My father is true. I know. Now, almost at times, bordering to righteousness, uh, which is to say the side of righteousness that we all dislike, self-righteousness. But Job thought he was Job thought he was pretty sharp. He was sharp enough to not heed the advice of the three men or anyone else, but to stick with the Father. And finally, Father has mercy on him. And he shows up on the scene. As Job is praying and chanting and wondering and, and uh, yet being true, God's going to show up on the scene, and this, uh, let me set the stage for you. He's going to show Job that men know nothing compared to our Father. Let's, let's enjoy it, if we may, with that thought in mind. Have you ever been in this position where you thought you had the world figured out, and you had all things figured out? Then let your Father speak to you through these words. Job chapter 38, verse 1. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Now what does whirlwind mean? It was a high polished bronze vehicle as described in Ezekiel chapter 1 that appeared whirling or appeared to whirl and the writer of this time could describe it only in one way. It was the same vehicle that God's throne was aboard in Ezekiel 1. God showed up on the scene, in other words. Listen to his words. Two, who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? Now, Elihu had just got through making a big, eloquent, religious speech. God said, who is that idiot that's speaking without knowledge? Naturally, Job's own conscience is going to bother him a little bit here in a moment because he's been declaring some pretty bold statements as far as his innocence goes. Verse 3, Gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee and enter thou me. In other words, you get up off that ground crying, whining, and feeling sorry for yourself. When you gird yourself up, you were ready for action. You stand up like a man of God, because I'm going to ask you a question, and I'm going to demand an answer. It's no different today, dear one, when God is proud of those that he chooses to give uh, knowledge concerning the events of this time. And they start whining because Satan gets to you and you let him. God's going to tell you, you get up. You stop feeling sorry for yourself. You stop whining. Well, you don't understand, Lord, I've got a sore arm. Forget the sore arm. Stand up like a man or a woman of God. I might touch it. God's not that concerned about our little flesh bodies, friend. He's concerned about your soul. What kind of stuff are you made out of? Stand up like a man. 
That's what he said. Verse 4. Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare it. Declare if thou hast understanding. You tell me where you were when I laid the very erect, the terra firma of this earth here in the heaven. Where were you, friend? Oh, that's way out, far gone, and past the understanding of man. That's the point. That's the whole point, friend. Man's not all that sharp. Verse 5. Who hath laid the measure thereof? If thou knowest, or who hath stretched the line upon it? Take Mars, Venus, uh, take all the planets, take all the stars, take this earth. Who laid out the geometric value of everything and placed them where they are? Tell me, Job. Do you know something? That little old spot you and your wife were having this morning becomes pretty insignificant, doesn't it? It really didn't have much to do with anything at all because, quite frankly, man without God has very little, if anything, at all to do with anything that's important concerning true knowledge and true understanding. Verse 6. Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened. Tell me why this earth stays as it is and where it is. What holds it here? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? That's a question, see. Verse 7. When the morning stars sang together, Stars is one of the names of suns. You will note in Revelation chapter 12 that there's a third of the stars or children of God that were swallowed or brought down by the tail of the dragon, which is to say Satan. These are God's children. Quite frankly, he's speaking of you. When the morning stars sang together, they were happy. And all the sons of God, of God shouted for joy. He's talking about the world it was. He's checking Job out. What do you know about the world that was, Job, before Satan brought about the destruction and man in his little old clay body started the yackety, yackety, yackety? Chatter, chatter, chatter. Chatter is not worth much, friend, compared to the wisdom and the knowledge of God. Verse 8. Or who shut up the sea with doors uh, when it broke forth as it had issued out of the womb? In God's writings in the Hebrew, it's quite obvious that he even looks at the earth as a womb that brings forth life. As the firmament um, gushed forth, who kept it in control? Verse 9. When I made the cloud, the garment thereof, catch the eye. When I made the cloud, the garment thereof, and thick darkness, a slaughtering band for it. In other words, God declares, I did. And the thick darkness, uh, the, the um, force, that causes a cloud to be dark, the band that holds a thunderstorm together. Verse 10, And break up for it my decreed place, and set bars and doors. And there's when that water rushed and fell upon the earth. I have no doubt in my mind that he's talking about the time when the firmament burst loose in the first upheaval at Satan's downfall, and the signs and traces thereof are very obvious in this world today, and I'm not talking about Noah's flood. God himself is saying, where were you when that was controlled, though it was an awesome, vicious force that destroyed everything It was still very close, uh, controlled, and I controlled it to the point I knew exactly where I wanted it to stop, verse 11, and said, Hitherto shalt thou come, but no further. 
and here shall thy proud waves be stayed, even as it rushed to the oceans and came to the beach. Oh, man can go out and build a little dike, and he'll spend generation after generation hauling junk out to keep it patched. And there, when God builds a levee, it stays. Twelve, hast thou commanded the morning since thy days? Have you told the sun to come up some morning, Job? You might say, well, it's just a natural thing. God has made the sun stand still. Can you do that? When you were arguing with your wife this morning or with your husband, could you have made the sun stand still? Or were you doing something important and caused the day spring to know its place? That it might take hold of the ends of the earth, that the wicked might be shaken out of it. You see, everything that God accomplished was ultimately to bring an end to the wicked in the lake of fire, to shake them out of the heavens, the untimely pigs, always in control on your behalf. And you would let Satan or one of his little friends persecute you when you have the power and the authority of he that controls the universe. When you have a destiny and a purpose, How important is your little life, sir, in the events that take place in this earth? I assure you, as long as you're doing the Father's work, and your destiny is to plant seed and to carry forth the work of truly teaching His Word, you have a very important life. But compared to the wisdom of God, don't listen to the yakers that know nothing, the empty heads, that say big swelling words that go nowhere, that have no logic nor meaning. Don't get too wrapped up in the traditions of men, in other words. Uh, verse 14. It is turned as clay to the seal, and they stand as a garment. Uh, but this really loses it in the translation. Let me let me um, let me translate it a little differently for you. Who could take the same earth clay that is and fashion a garment and put a man's soul in it and call it man? He's talking about you. Could you do it? Who could create? or form man from clay and cause him to exist. Hey, this is, don't feel all lonesome and pushed aside and not knowing anything. This is your father that accomplished it. That should make you proud, not frightened. That should make you be able to gird yourself. Do you know what gird means? Men at this time wore skirt like garments. And you reached down between your legs and got the back hem of that skirt and you pulled it up and you tucked it in your girt, your belt, whereby your old legs were free enough that you could do battle. You could do war. You were ready for action. He created the man. And he expects the man that he has chosen to be able to stand girded. That means do battle against the wicked forces. Not whine and whimper about it and let them get you down and stomp you. Your father was in control. That should please you to no end. And you couldn't even end further and make it speak. That's about applying the soul and making it speak. Fifteen. Inform the wicked, and whether inform the wicked, their light is withholding, and the high arm shall be broken, and all that is to say, crushed. Do you see what that means? God can control the minds of people, basically. What is the light? The light's the truth. The light is the knowledge of God. In other words, he, these, these uh, three good old buddies that were as stupid as stupid can be. Well, you're not supposed to call anybody stupid. I said they were stupid. 
because they were a typical man. They felt that Job would had to have sinned before God would allow him to be persecuted in that way. Uh-uh. God allowed Job to be persecuted because he didn't give it up and stand up and order this stuff out of his life. He allowed Satan to walk all over him. When his own father was at hand and in control. Verse 16. Hast thou entered into the springs of the sea, or hast thou walked in the search of the death? Do you know who supplies the water, Job, where the H2O forms and comes from? 17. Well, some chemist right away says, yeah, I know H, and I know, I, I, I know about oxygen and hydrogen and two parts of this and that. All right, then let's go with the hydrogen. And then from nothing, how would you declare that and bring it forth, friend? Man is stupid compared to the wisdom of God. 17. Have the gates of death been opened unto thee? Do you understand all about it? Or hast thou seen the doors of the shadow of death? Do you understand concerning the change in dimension of the spirit body as the soul leaves that chunk of meat and ascends back to me, Job? Can you explain that? Well, we just know that happened. No, no, that's not what God is asking. Do you know how it was accomplished? Your answer had better be no. 18. But what you should be proud of is that your father does. Hast thou perceived the breath of the earth? Declare it. And declare if thou knowest it all. If I were you, I would underline both of those words. Knoweth it all. Do you know any know it alls? I know one that knows all. It's my father. And I'm proud of him. My father can do anything. But he so chooses. Except force someone to love him. That he will not do. 19. Where is the way where light dwelleth? Where does light live, Job? And as for darkness, where is the place thereof? If you give that a spiritual depth and connotation, and when you understand that sentence, that question, and when you understand the light, and when you understand the darkness, and when you begin to realize but as he told you in verse 7 that you were a son of God, no gender. And from the Father, certainly, if you're his son or child, then you should have enough knowledge to know that if you stay in the light, that light distinguishes darkness. And that if you stay in the light, which he later sent, his son, A light wherein there is no darkness or misunderstanding. And certainly, you would be man or woman enough to control your own life. And when you think on those things, you see the nonsense that man allows to rule his life, arguing over nothing compared to the majesty of our Father. How many family traits do you have for him? Next time you end up growing angry at one of your loved ones, and a little argument seems like it just must come to pass, and think how proud that must make your father of you. And he just got through saying, Satan, what do you think about my child? What does Satan say about you? Oh, I can take that one any time I want to. They listen to me all the time. Don't shame your father. Gird yourself up. Stand up. Be a child of God. That pleases him. And he loves you for it. Okay, bless your hearts. We'll pick this up in the next lecture. Listen a moment, won't you please?
All right. Good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study. All praise God. We're ready to get into our Father's Word. We ask Him for a word of wisdom. We ask for understanding. As we continue a discussion, a discussion in Job, we might call it a special on Job. And so how it relates to us today. We ask it in Yeshua's precious name. Amen. I just want to touch for just a moment on some of the statements in the last lecture. The fact that Job in the Hebrew tongue means persecuted. And in a sense, being a type of God's elect. Documentation, the fact that Satan called him God's elect. Because God had a wall around him, and he only has that for those that have not free will. Job had earned uh, Job chosen before the foundations of the earth for your benefit. For your benefit as a type as to what would befall you if you allowed it. Now, I'm going to begin with the 40th chapter in this lecture. So we see 40 chapters of, uh, 38 chapters, 37 chapters rather, of chick chatter by man. Just chatter, chatter, chatter. A bunch of nonsense in part. As to what man can dream up as to what is a problem or something. God said it's men speaking without knowledge. Now that's about what it amounts to. And unfortunately many of our so-called experts today that are not grounded in our Father's scriptures are both it. It was, I mean, very adequately stated by our Father. Very wise in the ways of the world and the sayings and traditions of men by trial and error, this method is devised and that method method is devised. But never going to the book of instructions of our Father to learn how he said it would be just about perfect if you would do it that way. So we observed Job as he was trying to understand and find out and Declaring that he was he was not a sinner, and he was certainly an upright man, but he was almost to the point of being self righteous for one thing. And secondly, God went to a great deal to let Job know in that thirty eighth and thirty ninth chapter that man really didn't know all that much. He asked him some very leading questions. Where were you when I put this earth? in its position, and what holds it here? Where were you um, when I devised and brought about, even from clay, the body of man and put a living soul in it? Where were you, he states. And then he went into the various animals of nature. He said, you know, they do quite well in the desert, even without the help of man. He said, God's saying, I did a pretty good job out there of seeing that they knew when to bring forth, they knew when the season was. And many of the wild animals are all actually delivering at the time of labor and him. They didn't need a bit of help from man. God said, man never, never set foot in many places. And perhaps the earth was better off for it. In other words, God is asking Job a series of questions and they were saying that God doesn't need man. Now, you listen to me. God doesn't really need man all that bad, except for one thing. God wants the love of his children. But he manages real well without them. And in as much as, and this relates back and is interwoven with the fact that these three forms of Job have come up with most everything imaginable as to why God is punishing Job, and what was the real reason God was punishing Job? He wasn't. Job was allowing it. God had restricted Satan from taking the life of Job. So has he got his elect in these end times. You cannot touch my anointed. He's instructed Satan. Moreover, in Revelation chapter 9, he said, even those with free will that you go down to deceive, you cannot have their life. Only God can take that. So Satan is really very limited, but people will allow him to go on and on. 
And do you know something? Satan knows how to make the best out of men's chatter. That's to say, traditions of men. Satan can devise all sorts of pitfalls, both in a marriage, a company, uh, a party, and by that I mean a political party, um, or even a church, by the chatter of men. When we have his record set forth. In other words, they had left God out. Rather than saying, wonder why he's doing this and wonder why. Job was allowing it. You don't have to allow Satan to destroy your life. You can, you can gird yourself up, as he told Job. Get up from there, gird yourself, and stand up like a man. And if you're going to serve God, you're going to stand up like a man or woman of God. You're not going to be some wimp that falls down in tears at every little old thing that comes along. Sure, everybody slips, everybody slides, but Christians are supposed to take hold, pick back up, and if they don't, stand up yourself. Stand up in him. So finally, in this 40th chapter, Job finally answers God then. After God has really, in 38 and 39, I don't want to say put him to shame, but has made him stop to think. How little man really knows about how God accomplishes things. I'm talking about the creation. But certainly man should realize he's in control. And that his child has the authority to rebuke Satan. Okay, chapter 40, let's pick it up. These are the words of Job. Moreover, the Lord answered Job and said, I'm sorry, we have another sentence of our Father. Listen closely. Shall he that contendeth with the Almighty instruct him? Let that sink in right real good. He that contendeth with the Almighty, he that wants to argue or banner or uh, debate. You see, that's all this Job is about, a debate contending with God's plan, because they've gone away from it. They've drawn away from it. Those that would contend, you think you're going to instruct God? Of course, that's absurd. He that will prove with God, let him answer it. Verse 3. Listen carefully. I'm sure there have been many times in your life that you can say the same words that Job is about to repeat. And Job answered the Lord and said, For, Behold, I am vile. What shall I answer thee? I will lay my hand upon my mouth. You know, man, rather than chapter, chapter, chapter. Many times when something really important should be learned, would be a lot better off if you simply did that. In other words, keep your mouth shut rather than chapter. You see, God's wisdom coming from the mouth is beautiful, but chatter is chatter in anybody's language. Verse 5, Once have I spoken, but I will not answer, yea, twice, but I will proceed no further. In other words, Job said, I've been a fool, is what he's saying. I'm a vile person because... I didn't understand. I didn't take the authority, etc., etc. Verse 6. We answered the Lord into Job out of the whirlwind and said, Now stop and think a moment. What is this whirlwind? And then you have to go back to Ezekiel chapter 1. Again, this is important. That whirlwind is a whirling device. The color amber in Hebrew is highly polished bronze vehicle in which God's throne sits. And he instructs Job again. You know, <clears throat> excuse me, when God tells you something two times, you better listen. Listen to this verse. It's the second time God has repeated it to Job. Gird up thy loins now like a man, and I will demand of thee and declare thou unto me. You better learn how to obey God. You better learn how to be a man or a woman of God and stand up and act like it. 
You better take authority and use the power, or you're not a child of the Almighty, the All-Powerful. You're something else. What? I don't know. A wet noodle, maybe? God expects His men and women and children to act like men and women of God. Let some evil spirit come to the earth and push His children all about. Let some evil thing come on the surface and His children, I don't think we should say anything about that. Just say something about it. Walk the boat a little bit. It's good for people to get shook up. I know I shake many people up. It's good for you. Same as God told poor old Jonah, it's good for you to get angry a little bit every once in a while. Thing is, if you know this, I'll do the ordering, I'll do the commanding. Don't you try to instruct me, God says. But you stand up at the same time and obey and you act the part of a man or woman of God. Verse 8. Wilt thou also disannul my judgment? His judgment, you might better understand if you'd say his overall plan. Wilt thou also disannul my overall plan? And you know, I know many people that are pretty good scholars. And if you're not careful, I've seen them at times go quite contrary to the plan of God, get in his way. When a prophecy is written, even if it is in a negative sense, you better go about defending against it in the proper way, or you'll get square in God's way and don't try to disannul his plan. It's going to happen as it's written. Stand up like a man or a woman or a child and prepare for it. Wilt thou condemn me, that thou mayest be righteous? Boy, there's a lot said in that. I'm going to read it one more time, and I want you to let it soak in real good, because it's the little corner that just, I'm not going to say most, but many, many Christians put themselves into. Listen to it. Wilt thou condemn me? This is God speaking. That thou mayest be righteous. What he's saying here in the senses, I know what men are. I've listened to those three chatterbug ratchet jaws till I'm tired of hearing it. That's a nonsense. They want to be ever so righteous. You understand? He's saying they're self-righteous. Because any time that you can condemn God and perfecting your own righteousness, it's not righteousness in the holy righteousness of our Father, it's pure, the old, man-made, hypocritical self-righteousness. Unfortunately, many people condemn God. Let me rephrase that. Many people condemn God's plan because they're ignorant of the Word. They don't know what God's plan is. But I guarantee you, He's got a big boot, and he'll use it on you just as quick as he will someone that knows better. Because God's plan will not be altered. Do you hear me? You may be totally innocent, and you may not have to account for it. But if you get in his way, he's going to move you, friend. And you're going to wonder what this world is all about. Well, that doesn't seem fair, some might say. Well, what's not fair about it? You've got the plan right here. It's, you had it all the time. If you want to be ignorant, remain ignorant still. But you that will study God's word to understand that plan and not get in his way and not be some self-righteous religious hypocrite that knows absolutely nothing of God's overall plan, then be so. But I choose his word. I choose our Father in his way. I will not condemn him. I may sting the very hide off mankind at times, but it stings this old hide just as well in many cases. But I will teach the word as it is written. I want you to do likewise. Verse 9, Hast thou an arm like God? That's an easy question to answer. Or canst thou thunder like a voice like, uh, with a voice like him? Of course you can't to deck thyself now with majesty and excellence and array thyself with glory and beauty. 11. 
cast abroad the rage of thy wrath. And behold, every one that is proud and abase him. Oh, how God hates pride. Self-righteous pride. Do you understand that's what got Satan in trouble in the world it was? It's written. Your documentation is in Ezekiel chapter 28. As a matter of fact, God hates pride to the point that it was that reason that he condemned his own son created by him to death. I'm talking about the cherubim, Satan. In Ezekiel 28, it's written, Look on everyone that is proud and bring him low, and tread down the wicked in their place. Hide them in the dust together and bind their faces in secret. Listen to me. What you bind on earth is also bound in heaven. If, now here's that little word if I'm always warning you about. If you'll gird yourself up and take the, and stand up and take the part of a man or a woman of God. Listen, let me tell you something. Do you think when I call the wrath of God down on the cast and offend that would bless from the Father that that will go un, 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 attended? <laughs> Forget it. They will pay. That isn't a threat. It's a fact. Because God expects you to do that. He expects you to declare, hey, he can get the job done. But you have to take the authority when a, when a sword gets on your back to, or, or a, uh, a, uh, a mosquito to swat it off, to get rid of it, to kill it. Verse 14. Then will I also confess unto, the, unto thee that thine own right hand can save thee. She can do that. Behold now, behemoth. Behemoth. There is a controversy between the scholars. Some say this is an elephant, and some say it is a, um, a uh, what is this, large hippopotamus, all right? Well, um, it could be either. I'm simply going to say that. Which I made with thee, he with grass as an ox. You know, I hope you understand God's irony even maybe a little sense of humor. What have we just been talking about? How proud man can be sometimes. He said, Behold, look out there at that mammoth which I made with thee. I made both of you. He's giving you really something to be proud about, isn't he? Sometimes when you think you're really something on a stick, think about what God's opinion is when you act that way. He was grass or an ox. Maybe he has right sometimes. Oh, well, I want 60. Lo, now his strength is in his loins, and his force is in the navel of his belly. He moveth his tail like a cedar. The sinews of his stones are wrapped together. His bones are as strong pieces of brass. His bones are like bars of iron. He is the chief of the ways of God. Let me read that again. He is the chief of the ways of God. He that made him can make his sword to approach unto him. Do you understand what we're saying here? God's in control. And God can bring about control in any way he so chooses. Now, inasmuch as our father, and he is our father, is in control, Man doesn't really have to put up with a whole bunch, does he? He said, you let that little thing fall apart on you. And if you had believed in me, you could have even controlled the human. Surely the mountains bring him forth food where all the beasts of the field play. He lieth under the shady trees in the covert of the reed and fins. The shady trees cover him with their shadow. Hey, he's got it pretty good, is what God is saying. The willows of the brook compass him about. Behold, he drinketh up a river and hasteneth not. You didn't have to be, 
You see, most animals, when they do get a drink, they have to worry about being eaten alive. He doesn't have to. Take his good old easy time. He trusteth that he can draw up Jordan into his mouth. He taketh it with his eyes, his nose pierces, 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 pierces uh, the traps or snares, whatever you want to call it. Okay, I, I want to just speak, if I may, a little bit about this, chapter 41. You understand that there is prophecy within it. We're not going to cover it. The Leviathan will be discussed in it. What it relates to is the old crocodile of the Nile. Kind of draws a little bit from the power of Pharaoh, but it's talking about Satan. And he goes on, because Satan entered this back in the first chapter. Remember chapter 1, verse 7, walking before God? God says, what do you think about my man Job? He is something else. Satan says, I can take him. <laughs> I could take him in a minute if you will just pull down some of your protection of him there and your blessings. God said, have at it. I'm proud of him. This 41st chapter gives the strength of that old serpent. Gives you the strength of the devil. I want the character generator to slip right on ahead to chapter 41, verse 33, while I'm talking here a moment. He even talks about how that he has his own armor there in a sense, and you don't have too much armor to defend yourself against it. But you see, what God is leading up to in the overall message, and I'm not going into it in that much detail, is this. You have armor now that you can take anyone. It's the gospel armor. The gospel armor protects you from all things. We're going to pick up in chapter 41, verse 33, with the verse up on earth, there is not his like. And there isn't on this earth anything in his like. Satan is the subject. How precious it is. You gonna let him wallow you around? Hmm? Do you let him send some not not Satan himself, heaven only knows he's not due here for maybe even a few days when he's booted out of heaven at the seventh seal. He's coming. But you know what? His little old spirits take many of you. When all you have to say is, in the name of Jesus, uh, be gone. And have your whole life straightened out because of the power. In other words, stand up like a man or a woman of God and order them out of your life. And you stand there and turn everything into an argument many times within your family. You see, I want you to take this very personal, too, because that's where it starts, is in your home. And then you'll branch out to other places. Don't you dare put up with it, or you've got it coming just like Job did in all his righteousness. He let God out. He was always me. I didn't do this. I did do that. I do that, but I will not deny God. Now, he didn't deny God, but he didn't call on him either. You understand where I'm coming from? God seems to do pretty well as he's made the point real good without man. But the point is this, man can't make it without God. You need that power because he has uh, even, uh, he uses animals as symbology that Satan himself is allowed to take you in if you will let him. I don't know how stupid, uh, I'm going to use the term, I don't know how stupid one could be when they know from our Father's word that they don't have to put up with it but they'll simply allow Satan to enchant them. Do you know what that means? Literally hypnotize them by the mundane, ready little old things of life, if you allow it to fall into that, with boredom. And meanwhile, he's got you about halfway down, just stomp you the rest of the way in some tragedy or something till you don't know from come sick of what happened, and you allowed it because you wouldn't girt yourself up with the gospel armor on in place and stand up and said, No more! 
and make something out of yourself. You allow some little old habit or something else to to just take eat you up. But and you know something? It's not even your spirit. Your spiritual. Do you think your spiritual body has any need for drugs? Of course not. It's that chunk of meat that you live in. Uh, let me say that again. Your spiritual body has no need whatsoever of drugs. It's that little old chunk of meat you live in with all its little old nerve centers that are all connected right up at the root of your little old bitty deposit of gray matter. Let me that you and say, I gotta have a fix. Oh God, you'll die. You'll die if you don't get a fix. And you listen to it. Who do you think you're listening to? You cut yourself up and you stand up. God has a destiny and a purpose for you, and I assure you it isn't to waste yourself. It isn't to poison what little gray matter you've got up there, but to cause it to increase with the wisdom of God, not the wisdom of man. Stand up and, you know, well, I, I need it to get away. I, I need it to kind of numb the pain. If you'll stand up and stop whimpering and crying and girt yourself up with the gospel armor, you'll find out that this is the most exciting time that there has ever been to live in this earth age. Because God is looking for some champions that can dwell in the spirit for just a moment and tell, as Job said, I'll put my hand over my mouth and keep it shut to tell the flesh to sit down, shut up and wait. You feed it when you're ready and it won't be with poison, but with fuel that will assist you in being a champion of new people, standing up, girded, ready to do spiritual battle for the living God against this uh, never time. I want to pick it up in chapter 41, verse 33. You can read it for yourself. As I said, I will never do the entire book of Job on television. It's just too much chatter. But I do want you to get the audio tapes. And when you've got time, I think there's about seven 90-minute tapes. I may be wrong in that. Look at your tape list. Everyone should go through it one time. That's why it is so long. And so you don't forget. So you don't allow yourself to get into that trap. You don't allow yourself to become a wet noodle, slippy, slopping, and sliding around everywhere rather than standing up and acting like a man or woman of God. Chapter 41, as it continues the thought about Satan, Revitine 33, Upon earth there is not his like who is made without fear. I want you to know it didn't say heaven. All right, a word to the wise is sufficient. You can pick it up for yourself. He beholdeth all high things. He is a king over all the children of pride. Do you know why he was the king of pride? Pride itself caused his sentence to death. Verse 42, then Job begins to speak again. Then Job answered the Lord and he said, I know that thou canst do everything, and that no thought can be withholding from thee. God knows what we're thinking. Satan doesn't. You see, that's where we have far the advantage, being wiser than the serpent. He can't read your mind. God can. Who is he that hideth counsel without knowledge? Therefore have I uttered that I understood not. Things too wonderful for me, which I knew not. Who hideth, who hideth the counsel without knowledge? Satan, you know, Elihu, that stupid prophet that came on the scene. And I'm going to tell you what, there's just a lot of stupid prophets in the world today. If you've never learned about Elihu, friend, you better. Or you're going to end up listening to one of them and you'll think he's got great stuff. Did you hear me? God placed the book of Job in his word to keep you from being deceived by some false prophet or false teacher or false preacher, minister, whatever you want to call him. Sure, it takes a little time and sure, it's a lot of chatter. 
that is planned by your Father so that you learn the lesson well. Verse 4, Here I beseech thee, and I will speak. I will demand of thee, and declare thou unto me. I'm going to ask you, and I want you to please tell me. I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eye seeth thee. Therefore I abhor myself, I hate myself because I've allowed this to happen, and repeat in dust and ashes. I'm going to tell you something. Repent, repentance is good for the soul, dear one. If you've been in one of these little ego trips, or if, you, if you've been so nerd and numb that you've allowed Satan to come into your family and kick up dust without at least half of You see, if only one member of the family will stand up like a man or a woman of God, it will straighten the rest of the family out. Begin to do it God's way. And many of you teenagers that give your parents a great deal of trouble because you might be smart in a little. Why don't you be the one in your family to be a man or woman of God with a destiny? Have you always known there was more to God's word than you had been told? Why don't you play the part of a hero? Why don't you tell that miserable wreck of a frame that you live in flesh that's so detailable when we talk about the eons of time to sit down and shut up and let you, a man or a woman or a girl, a child of God, stand up uh, and be somebody. Take charge. Study God's Word. Grow strong. Order Satan out of the lives of your family and have a happy family. It takes a little power. It takes a little authority. It takes a little strength. But if you will repent, if you will tell him you're sorry, don't leave him out. Ask him to come into your family. You'll straighten your family out and you will have a happy home. It doesn't mean you're, that Satan's going to try again, but when he does kick him in the teeth with the name of Yeshua Messiah, he won't be back around very often. Don't let his little evil ones tear you up and don't let your own flesh negative thoughts take a family into the grind. It's so Wonderful to feel the power of the living God. You possess it when you believe on Him and when you repent. And when you put the gospel armor on, which simply means to believe and have His faith in Him as your shield. Do you know what that means? If you have faith in Him that He will protect you, He'll shield you against anything. Even that deepest of cravings, if you are really a man or a woman of God, or you can tell the flesh to shut up. Okay, bless your hearts. We're going to stop it with that. I hope you've learned from this book of Job. Job meaning persecuted. You've been persecuted? When persecution hits you, what do you do? Oh, boy, that start whining. Don't do it. When persecution hits you, you stand up. And you gird yourself up and you charge. And you order it out of your family. Don't you bring pain on those you love. Don't you blame one that you love for something Satan or a negative thought has brought into your family. Put the blame where it lies and get rid of it. In the name of Jesus. All right, bless your hearts. I hope you've all enjoyed this book of Job. You can sure grow by it. It's our Father.